Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, Greetings. We do want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we gather to spend time in the Word, that we might see Jesus more clearly, that we might be like Jesus more. Amen. For the glory of the Father. Hallelujah. Everything. Everything for the glory glory of the Father. Last week, we started kind of a a new segment of this study. Mm -hmm. And it's about what a well-dressed Christian should wear, right? So we're going to pick up where we left off there. But before we do that, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word. And just let us dig into it and put it in our brains and put it in our hearts for your glory. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, We left off last week, and again, as I say, we're talking about what a Christian should wear. Mm -hmm. But we're also looking at it from the proper perspective because the things of God are spiritually appraised. So we're looking at this spiritually. This is not a matter of, you know, what store you should shop in and whether you should wear sports coats or... Levi's. It's a it's a matter of understanding how God wants us to be clothed. Yes. So we talked last week. The single probably most important one, which appears so many times in the New Testament, is that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. That we would be in Christ Jesus. But we left off on a verse, and I want to start this this session with this that verse from Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse twenty three, verse twenty three and twenty four. That you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Well, uh, I'm going to already get distracted here. (laughs) Doesn't take much. No, because remember, this is this is first and foremost a study of the word. So regardless of where it takes us, as long as we're looking at Jesus Christ, who is the word. The spirit of prophecy is a testimony of Jesus Christ. The law is a tutor to lead you to Christ. Everything after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is commentary on you. So it's all about Jesus, all right, for the glory of the Father. But what I wanted to say is that people always say, that I, I always hear, saints and sinners alike say, you know, well, everybody's made in the image of God. And you may have heard it because I've done teachings on this. Mm-hmm. Before we were saved, we're not, we don't come into this world in the image of God. Adam was made in the image of God. Yes. And Eve came out of Adam, mm-hmm. so she had that. Mm-hmm. But then after the fall, they were deformed by sin, because trust me, sin is a deformity. Yes. And they, they no longer looked like God. They were no longer in the image of God, yes. because he has no sin. Yet... As soon as they were outside the garden, it says that Adam knew Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. Mm -hmm. Well, that son did not come into the world in the image of God. He came into the world in the image of Adam. Yes. Now, this is why Jesus said to to Nicodemus in John chapter Mm 3, that we have to be born again. You must be born again, that you're born of your father who is in heaven. Because otherwise, we have the stain of sin uh, in our DNA. Mm -hmm. But when you're born again, your Father in heaven has no sin. He only has, He only is righteousness. And that's all that's conveyed to us, okay? So we're to put on the, the, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, okay? Which is in the likeness of God. So bear that in mind, because all of the all of the clothing, all of the things that we're supposed to be wearing, the apparel, the spiritual apparel that we're supposed to be wearing, is all about our relationship with God. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, in the natural, certainly clothing has a purpose of identifying us. Uniforms. Yes. All right. People, people wear uniform. By the way, and that's much more common outside of the United States than it is in the United States. But here in the United States. You see, you see a policeman mm-hmm. because of his uniform. You immediately know oh, yes. he's a policeman or a fireman mm-hmm. or people in the medical profession. You see them and you, you realize right away what they are because of the, the, the apparel they're wearing, right? Well, they are outward appearance. That's true with sports teams. Mm-hmm. Okay? You, you watch 
whatever sport you're into and there are two teams playing, you can tell them instantly by their uniforms. And how, what kind of chaos would it be if they were all dressed alike? You wouldn't know who is who. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's purpose in that. Schools, we, we've started and run Christian schools. And in our schools, we always had the children wearing uniforms. As a matter of fact, not only did the children wear uniforms, but the staff wore, you, wore uniforms. Yes. I got a question. You go to school school visits. visits. Yes. How? What percentage of the schools that you visit have uniforms? That's a good question. I would say now probably the majority of the ones majority we visit, them, yes. uh, and we always recommend that they do mm-hmm. because we found we found it in our, in our ministries so beneficial uh, f- for children. It, it removes that peer pressure about yes. what you're wearing. It makes it easier for the parents. It, may, it winds up making it easier for the children. Yes. And it used to be great because as we went on field trips and so forth with our mm-hmm. students, we always got comments about how well-behaved they were, and they were immediately recognizable. Mm-hmm. You know, you see this unit, all the children are dressed alike. That's not a bad thing, and it doesn't remove their individualism. Mm-hmm. It gives them opportunity to express their individualism because in spite of what the world will tell you, clothes don't make the man. No. Okay? One of the interesting things is, um, at my job, I work with a lot of women. And sometimes you walk in, and it's a manufacturing plant. And you think you've walked into a fashion show. And I'm, right. and I'm really wondering, what are they thinking? Because well, it's a place of work not a place to impress other people. But one of the problems with that is that's a, that there is, this, there is this peer pressure that is put on by our culture that demands so often that they do that. And that's one of the, thing, the reasons we like the idea of uniforms. And by the way, as I said, you know, much more than here in the United States, if you go to England, we, were in, we lived in Latin America, so many places that we've traveled in Europe, where you see in, uh, where people in stores, in grocery stores, well, here, here in grocery stores, oftentimes they have uniform. some kind of uniform. They, right? they wear a smock or something. Right. Yeah. Something, you know, like we shop in Publix. And they have Remind me to charge them for shirts. advertising. Yeah. 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 So they'll have golf shirts. They're all the same. Mm-hmm. But I, I find that very beneficial in so many ways. Uh, so we do. help, you know who to look for. Look. Yes. As part of our ministry, I'm on the board of directors of an accrediting body for Christian schools. So I, what Mark was saying is I get to go, and Alice goes with me, we visit with a lot of Christian schools. And if they're not using uniforms, we, we talk to them about it. We don't give them rules to follow that way, but yeah. we, suggestions, yeah. we give them suggestions and encourage them and talk about the benefits of that. But as I said, you go in a lot of places around the world, and you see, we live in Central America. I tell you what, the, all the stores... All yes. the stores, they have uniforms. And that's very much true, uh, or it's very, uh, it's too true to a great degree in England. Mm-hmm. You'll go into stores, the major department stores, and you'll find that they're wearing some kind of uniform. Um, the point is, it just, but the thing is, it makes people identifiable. Yes. Okay? So that's very much true with those the uniforms that I talked about. You know, policemen, firemen, mm-hmm. uh, sports people, medical professions. I can't even... Right. Think of but it made me just now think that these people that are in uniform, they're connected as a unit. Yes. So it it's a sense be, of community. Yes. yes. Is there like a unity in that when you see them? Yeah. In- and it gives them a sense of unity. Yes. It, it gives, also them, gives them a sense of responsibility. It gives them a sense of community. Well, and, and well, it should because they represent something when they're out there. Right. You know, when you see an officer, a policeman in uniform, you know, his actions reflect on all policemen. Right. When you see, you know, somebody, when you see a student wearing a school uniform, their behavior reflects on the entire entire school. school. Well, you can, you as a teacher that have gone out with a pack of students can pick out your students very easily. So if one is acting up, you know, even from the back, front or side, that's your student. But let me bring this back to what our focus is here today. You need to understand that. We as Christians, that's the whole point of this, Mm -hmm. is we do wear a uniform. And that uniform should make us immediately recognizable, Mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Religious leaders, religious people around the world have always worn uniforms. I mean, I can can talk about Catholic priests or, you know, so many denominations uh, where they wear 
clerical garb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We'll call it. Well, I mean, but that's just one. I mean, there are there are many other uh, denominations yeah. that do the same yeah. thing. Or, I mean, it's not just that collar. Mm. I mean, you start to get into the the Rastafarians have the dreadlocks. Yeah, but when I, let me when you get into the Christian denominations, okay. some of them, I mean, become extremely, extremely ornate. Flamboyant. Okay. Well, in the Orthodox churches, in the Catholic church, in the Orthodox churches, it's just, yes, the, the local parish priest may just have on a, you know, a black suit and a, a white collar. But you start talking at the cardinals and bishops and um, the regalia they wear, it can be, it can be pretty astounding. Mm-hmm. Which puts me in mind of the time of Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. because then you had the Pharisees, yes. the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees, I mean, go read Matthew 23 and see what Jesus says about these, you know, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his time. Mm-hmm. He has very little good to say about them as a class because of their hypocrisy, because of their pride, because they were always looking for that first place, right? And they distinguished themselves by what they wore. Um, they, and it says, it says in the Bible, it says in John 12, that they love the approval of men mm-hmm. rather than the approval of God. Okay? Yes. So they use their clothing to set themselves apart and to show their holy superiority, just as Jesus noted. Because it says in Matthew 23, speaking of them, the scribes and the Pharisees, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylactery, phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Mm-hmm. Matthew 23, 5. What is a phylactery? Aha. I thought somebody might ask that question. The phylactery, it, it comes from Deuteronomy, right? From the law. In, in Deuteronomy 11, it says, You shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. So now remember, the things of God are spiritually appraised. The problem with the law, and this is what Paul talks about so much in the New Testament, is that the letter kills. So they're taking everything in the most literal sense. So the phylacteries were like little leather boxes where they had scripture in them. And they had long... uh, Hassle. That's not what Like leather straps. And they would wrap it around their, their, their hands and then actually around their forehead and have that little leather box on their forehead. The tassels were... And this is... Now, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, okay? Unless, because God searches the heart. Man looks at outward appearance, but God searches the heart. And if he sees within a heart that people are doing this in order to be noticed by men, to get the approval of men, to feed their pride, then you got a problem. The tassels, this also comes from the law, all right? Mm -hmm. Let me read you from Numbers 15. I'm going to read from 38 and 39. Numbers 15, verse 38 and 39. Speak to the sons of Israel and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and that they shall put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes after which you played the harlot. Okay. Do you know the one lady that was healed of an issue of blood after 12 I years? I do. I know the account of a woman who had been healed you know, for 12 years. and then she, she shouldn't have reached out because she touched the garment of Jesus. No, and no, that's no, what she was going no, after. No, not, not, not just the garment. She touched the... the well... The, that. What she touched was the tassels. Mm-hmm. Because Jesus, remember, he never broke the law. He would have also had those tassels on his garments. Mm-hmm. The Jewish men did. Right. Okay? And that would, but the purpose of that was not to show off that, hey, I'm following the commandments of God. And she was unclean. It's to remind you that you're supposed to be right with God in your heart. Okay? Mm-hmm. But remember what it said. About the Pharisees that I just read in Matthew 23, they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels. In other words, they took More what nice. they wanted to make theirs bigger and better. It's like a neon sign. Because they want to show how holy they are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay? What you're wearing will not make you holy. 
And unfortunately, a lot of people in the in the church today don't realize that. They just, you know, they, they think your holiness is about the outward garments. Okay. And we're going to talk about that, right? So it was indeed the fringe, the tassels of Jesus' garments that the woman with the, the hemorrhage um, had, as well as a multitude in Gen Ge- Ge- Esaret, all right? Because it says in Matthew 30, 14, 35, when the men of that place recognized him, Jesus, they sent into all that surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick, and they began to entreat him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. And as many as touched it was, were cured. They're talking about the tassels. Where are you? That was Matthew 14, verses 35 and 36. So the question becomes, do you wear what you wear to be seen by God or to be seen by man? That's that's a, the realistic question. Is, is there a scripture verse that says there is he, healing in the tassel? Absolutely the, not. No. I thought there was no, but there's, healing in, his, in that garment. No, there's not. Because the healing is not in the garment. The healing is in Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. The power is in him. And because when he was touched by that woman, he said the power is gone. He, he the felt power. power. Okay. They, the tassels were there to remind. Let me just read you one more time, right? So you, you get this, right? The purpose of the tassels were on the corners of the garment that they shall put on a tassel on uh, each corner. It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord. Okay. Sometimes it's like, you know, we, we have things that keep help keep the word in front of us, keep it fresh. Now, you don't have to wear a T-shirt or, you know, there's no uniform. You, you see this. Christians wearing T-shirts with slogans on them or anything. I, I'm not going to sit here and say there's anything necessarily wrong with that. However, I will say this. If people can't recognize you by what's inside of you, and you're depending on what's on outside of you for them to see that you're a Christian, you've got a problem. Yes. You know, I'm just thinking about that. And if you wear something on your shirt, you can't see it. But if you wear something on your arm that you can yeah. actually read, then you can see it. And yeah. other people may not. Yeah. So but, but the point why is, are you yeah. doing it? That, well, you're doing it to be seen by men. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things. I mean, obviously, a lot of people, I, you drive down the road and you see people honk if you, with a bumper sticker, honk if you love Jesus. Right. Come on, give me a break. Um, I, we, we. The bond servants, the disciples of Jesus Christ, are to proclaim the excellencies of Him. Mm-hmm. We've gotten to a place where we slough that off and trust in something else to do our work for us. The outward sign. I mean, to some degree, I even have this problem with tracks, passing mm-hmm. out tracks, because oftentimes people hand out tracks so that they don't have to interact with another person. Mm-hmm. It becomes a substitute Mm -hmm. that you wear something on your T-shirt so you don't have to say something to somebody. Mm -hmm. No, we need to be saying something. That's the danger of this. And that's why you have to be careful about what you're wearing and why you're wearing it. Like I said, with religious leaders today, I had a a buddy, a Catholic priest. And uh, this is years ago. I'm talking, this is almost 40 years ago. He and I were having a conversation and he had just come back from a river cruise in Europe. And he mentioned to me that he didn't wear his clerical garb because he didn't want people to, to notice that he would. I said, it shouldn't take right. clerical garb for people to notice That's right. your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I mean, I wasn't saying that to be mean to him or anything, but that's truly what I believe. It shouldn't take the way you dress for people to see Jesus Christ in you. Because Jesus said, it's by their fruit you'll see them. Right. If people can't see God's love in you, I don't care what you wear, you're missing the boat. Mm-hmm. If people can't see God's joy in you, I don't care how you dress. And especially in this day and age, if they can't see God's peace. You know, I'll tell you a story. As a matter of fact, Mark's been to Africa with us, all right? We've been over in West Africa. And I was preaching over there, and somebody came up to me at one fairly large church. And I had on a, a blue sport coat that I wore. As a matter of fact, uh, you can see it in photographs of me back in 2007. Or you can see photographs of me last week wearing the same same coat. 
But it just so happened that over in this part of West Africa at the time, they were very, very enamored of a particular American pastor who preacher who was a pastor of a mega church. And he wore suits that were fairly unique. They had a, they had an a- absolute style to them. And I noticed that a lot of the pastors over there were wearing that suits style. of the same. They were imitating him. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, you know, one of the, a bishop that was a buddy of mine came up to me and he said, why don't you wear suits like that? I said, because I'm not trying to imitate him. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm trying to imitate Jesus Christ. I, I got to tell you one quick story. As a matter of fact, Mark and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, years ago, I, I was a full-time pastor up in New York. I was also full-time executive in a communications company. I was also working pretty full-time on converting a bus into a motorhome mm-hmm. because Alice and I were planning on going on the road traveling as we turned the church over to somebody else. And when I first bought this bus, it was a conversion. It was a 35-foot uh, flat-nosed school, school bus. bus. And I was doing the work. You know, I, I'd go do my job during the day, which also, by the way, was part of my ministry. And I'd come back and we'd do Bible studies every night, all night. I mean, and then when I get through midnight, I'd go out and I'd start working on the bus. And I'd work on the bus for a few hours. But this one day I was working on this bus and we had taken, we had just bought the bus and we had taken all of the seats out of it. You know, it had been a school bus, so it had all those seats in it. I took all the seats out and then the next thing I did was I went up to the Motor Vehicle Bureau. And this is in New York, right? The Motor Vehicle Bureau is a challenge. Mm-hmm. I'm just letting it go down. A bureaucratic challenge. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people. So I was dressed in uh, Levi's and uh, a sweatshirt, and I had been working on the bus. I mean, I had probably grease on me and sawdust. wood shavings and sawdust, yeah. So I went there, and I went up to the counter, and, and I applied for license plates for this, for this bus. And I wanted to register it as a motorhome. Because the rates for a motorhome and rates for a bus are very, very different. Much, both of which are much higher than the rates for a car. So I went and I, I started explaining and I gave the form over to this woman at the desk. And she looked at it and she said, uh, this was registered as a bus, a school bus. And I said, yes. But I applied for a registration for a motorhome. And she said, well, she said, uh, does it have a bed in it? And I said, no, not yet. She said, well, then it's not a motorhome. She said, it has seats in it. I said, no, it doesn't, because I had already taken all the seats out. And she said, well, then it's not a bus. <laughs> so the upshot was she is literally refusing to give me any kind of Please. registration for the car, for the bus, because <laughs> it's in her mind, it's neither a bus nor a motorhome. So I asked her, I said, can I speak to your supervisor? So she called over her supervisor, another woman. And she came over and we're going through this whole thing again. And finally she looked at me and she said, what do you want? What are you doing? And I said, I need this to to travel the country and preach the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she looked at me and she said, you're a preacher? I said, I certainly am. She said, you don't look like one. And I said, well, have you ever met my brother Jesus, who was a carpenter? And she looked at me. She looked at the other woman. She said, give me the registration. So they filled out the registration, and they gave me a registration for a car. A 33-foot-long car? 30, a 30, 35-foot-long car, <laughs> which was like a, a third of the price of the others. I had the, I had the biggest car in the state of New York. <laughs> but she was judging me by outward appearance, which people do. All right? I think it was when she saw my attitude, my joy, and my peace about the whole thing, that what she saw was what I was wearing on the inside. inside. Right. I was wearing robes that of righteousness. Shined through. I had on the garments of, of joy. And you didn't get offended when no. she said, no. uh, you don't look like a preacher. Yeah. You just yeah. came back with, yeah. neither does Jesus yeah. when he's a carpenter. So, but, but the point is, that's the kind of thing that happens. People should, at the end of the day, be able to recognize Christ in you, the Holy Spirit in you regardless of what kind of clothing you have on the outside. Mm-hmm. If we become dependent on the clothing to communicate our relationship with God with other people, we are in error. Right. We are in error. 
And don't you think that like in a building, a church building, that people who are in the building act differently than when they're outside the building? Absolutely. So if they're dressed in a certain garb, they will act differently right. than if they're in their regular. Uh, it would have been interesting if that priest that you were talking about that went on a cruise is for him to do the first, like, however many days in regular outfit, but the last day, wear the collar. Yeah, but he wasn't experimenting. He, yeah, was, he, was, he was trying yeah, to be on vacation. Get, yeah, he was trying to get away from it. Yeah, he was well, just to, that yeah. one day would have really oh, yeah. changed the well, attitudes. The, the point is, and this is, you know, because we started all of this as let a man examine himself. Mm. So the question is, do you examine yourself and see, can people see the life of Christ in me? Or do I have to wear the right clothes on a Sunday to go into the church so people think I'm a Christian? Mm. Do I have to have some kind of this bauble or trinket on me or a T-shirt with a slogan on it mm. for people to see that I'm a Christian? I can't tell you how many times I have encountered people who are wearing a cross. And I've had the opportunity. I'll go up and I'll poke them right on the cross wow. and say, is that, a, is that a decoration or a declaration? A lot of people are wearing the decorations without having a heart that is declaring the mm. Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. This is, it's an important, a really, really important topic. I mean, th and this is, it's an important topic, which is why we're studying it, okay? We need to be showing the evidence of Christ in our lives. That's what we're supposed to be wearing because we're appraising things spiritually. We, we talked about this a, a bit last week when we talked about all the things, you know, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on the robes of righteousness, put on the garments of praise, all of these things. Uh, and it's an attitude, the attitude of the righteous. It's the attitude of the righteous. It is. Absolutely it is. Um, you know, throughout religious history, even among the Jews, and then certainly within the Christian, much within the Christian church, it has always been a point that in order to show your, uh, I don't want to sound facetious, but your exalted position, mm -hmm. that you had to wear very fancy garments so people would immediately recognize that you're something special. Right, right. Do you think Jesus did that? No. I don't think so either. Mm. I don't think so either. I, I think that it, when, when all is said and done, our heart is visible to people. They may not like it. May, it may take some time. But I believe that while the Lord God said, man judges by outward appearance, mm -hmm. there is something within us called the Holy Ghost, yes. which will make himself evident in our lives when we are walking in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. So, as I said, this really is an important topic. And we really didn't get much far <laughs> into this today. Oh my. But, but do me a favor and be back for the next time because I really want you to participate. And you can get on Facebook, facebook.com slash Bible Talk 2, and come and participate. Give us your comments, your questions. But until then, Hi. hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that you have clothed us, that you have given us these robes of righteousness that you have given us your son, Christ Jesus, that we might put him on in our lives, that we have new life that we can put on as a garment, Lord God. Lord, help us to have a heart that where our desire is not that people see us in any event, but they look at us and they see you. In Jesus' name I pray that. Amen and amen. Till next time, God bless you and goodbye. I will cling to that old